moment you start to let go of that, your perceptions start to increase. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming by. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 358. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Sifu Singh. Maybe you're new to the show. Maybe you don't know my voice. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick. And I love martial arts. You can check out everything we do at whistlekick.com. And if you buy something over there, you can save 15% using the code PODCAST15. We're adding new stuff all the time. If you want to check out the show notes for this or any of the other 357 episodes that we've got, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got a YouTube channel and a rapidly growing Instagram account. We've got Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're all over the place because we want to make sure that wherever you love and celebrate martial arts, we're there with you. Everyone has a story to tell. Everyone's journey into and through the martial arts is different, but at the same time, they're all pretty similar. What is not always the same is the level of passion that people have. Sometimes people have a lot of passion when they start and it fades over time. Or sometimes people have a moderate amount of passion for their training and they continue with that moderate amount of training. But then some come in hot, they're passionate about their training, and yet as their lives go on, they continue to become more passionate. Martial arts continues to occupy a great place, even a growing place in their hearts and in their minds. And I think that's a good way to characterize today's guest. I think you'll enjoy this one. I know I did. So let's step back and welcome him to the show. Sifu Singh, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Jeremy, thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's an honor to have you. We're going to have a ton of fun. I can already tell. Usually in the first 30 seconds, when, when, the, when the interview connects, connects, I can tell who I've got on the line. I can tell their personality. I can tell whether we're going to jive and have some fun. And, and something tells me we're going to have some fun today. I'm, I'm no doubt about it. <laughs> Maybe I should have said that at the end. Now, now I've set the bar a little high. Everybody's nervous. <laughs> we got this. No, I know we got this. Cool. Well, hey, you know, it's a martial arts show. And so our jumping off point, it's the same pretty much each time, but it kind of has to be, doesn't it? Because we need some context for you as a martial artist. So how did you get started? Um, well, I started when I was six years old in Washington Ryu Karate in Toronto at the University of Toronto Karate and Judo uh, under um, Sensei Bert Konzak. Uh, we were immigrants. I'm of an Indian background um, and from India. And my family immigrated to Canada when we were really young. And um, my dad wanted, to, my dad traveled a lot. So my dad was a sea captain at that time. And he wanted to make sure that, you know, growing up in a foreign country and stuff like that, I was able to defend myself, and, you know, build the confidence and things of that nature. I actually remember when I was still living in India, um, you know, up till the age of three or three, three and a half, because about three, three and a half, we left India and I lived on a ship till I was about six. Um, and we lived all over the world. But I still remember over my crib, there was a, a giant poster of Bruce Lee and one of Muhammad Ali that my dad had picked up in one of his, uh, in one of his uh, trips. So I still remember that so vividly. And so I think that was always an interest of his. And he also wanted to make sure that we could protect ourselves. So I, I got into karate and then I, I did karate from six to, uh, you know, 18. And uh, it was a big part of my life. I competed. And uh, then, I, then I moved to the United States, actually on a tennis scholarship. I attended the University of California, Davis. Um, to do my computer and electrical engineering degree. So I put martial arts on a little bit of a hold for, you know, three, four years there while I was focused on uh, tennis. And then um, a couple of events happened. Uh, one of the major ones was in 2001 when I was, we went to celebrate a graduation bonfire in a place called Ocean Beach in San Francisco. It was like literally like a scene out of a movie. You know, we, uh, we drove down to this bonfire celebration. We were the last two cars to get there was pitch black at night and the parking lot if you can picture the scene 
is elevated and then you have to walk down from the parking lot some stairs and then there's the beach and then people are about 100 yards away so they were about 100 150 yards away down on a beach and we're elevated in this parking lot and then while we're in that parking lot you know what happens one of the lessons i learned there and then one of my teachers later pointed out that hey sing uh, bad things happen to you when you least expect it and you're having a good time and, you're, and your guard is down so you know what do you do your college kids celebrating graduation you pull up pull up your cars because we we're the last two cars to arrive there's about five six of us and you know what do you do you pop up in a beer and celebrate and do a cheers and that's exactly what we're doing and then literally out of the darkness uh you know 25 local gangsters that that was their turf and we had no idea of this because davis is outside of sacramento which is two hours away from San Francisco. And, you know, I, I wasn't even from California, so I had no idea of any of this stuff. So, you know, they were looking for someone and they were iced out Their Their, their eyes were totally glazed. They, they were like, looked like they were on another planet. And, um, you know, they approached us and, the, you know, first of all, it's like talking about attention and awareness being down a 25 people approach you and you don't react or move or anything like that. At that time, you know, you just think that you're invincible and nothing can happen to you. And so these guys approached us and it was really interesting. They, they had a form and a format of how they would go through it. So one of the guys um, uh, asked one of, my, one of the guys to the right of me for a cigarette because you're smoking a cigarette. And while we looked over there, they all of a sudden grabbed my roommate because they were looking for somebody. And it, it appeared that the, the guy they were looking for, they thought was my roommate because he resembled that person. And then 10 of them grabbed him, took him to the center. The other 10 formed a perimeter and then five people attacked out of there. So within a flash of a second, all chaos had broken loose. And that was the very first real moment of my life. You know, I've been in uh, competition sparring before, been in one-on-one -on -one street fights here and there before, but this, this was different. This was chaos. They didn't care. It was, it was like war. And, um, like no disregard for somebody getting hurt or not getting hurt. All I remember was they grabbed him and a two by four coming at me. I did an upper block, snapped my elbow, and then I'm running. And then you have to make this decision happens where you actually go through the process of fight and flight and you have to make a decision. Do I just run away or do I help my, my friend? And, you know, I, I decided, hey, I, I can't run away. But at the same time, I didn't know what to do. So I didn't know what to do in this scenario. It was crazy. And it was like nothing out of the movies, nothing we had ever trained for, nothing, we'd, any kind of thing I've ever experienced like that before. People didn't come at you one at a time. People were charging you. And it really ended up looking more like a rugby match of people chasing me through cars. And that's what it looked like. And uh, swinging and you're hitting the back and you're running and they're chasing around you. So it looked more like rugby and football. And I'm the guy they're trying to tackle running in between the cars than any kind of thing where, you know, in a classical Kung Fu movie, everybody circles you, pack one at a time. It wasn't anything like that. But the most two distinct things I remember was one, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know, how, I didn't have a strategy. I didn't have a tactic. I'd never experienced it. But on the other side of it, that was the first time in my life I experienced what I call the high performance zone. You know, in my, I have a new book coming out. It's called Mind Boxing, How to Win the War Within. And one of the most important things is how do we get into this zone? And, and that was the first time I had experienced it. It was like this elevated state of attention and awareness. Like time started to totally slow down. I felt like I was in the matrix. And, and, and awkwardly, it felt really peaceful amongst this chaos. It was the weirdest experience that I'd ever had in my life. Um, so that went on for about, you know, three to four or five minutes, maybe then somebody had obviously called the police and you see the police starting to come down there about two miles up above the hill. But before they could make it down, the two guys that they were actually, uh, looking for happened to have walked by. And when they walked by, these guys just jumped on them. They forgot about us and they jumped on the two guys. And I remember dragging my, my roommate away and then dragged him to the beach. I came back up running back up like, man, I need to get like a license plate or something. By this time, those guys are, are loading up in their cars to get away and are still remembered just like yesterday, there was a white Escalade and I'm looking at the white es Escalade, but I couldn't make out the, the, the license plate. It was only about maybe 30, 30 feet, 40 feet away from me. I couldn't make it out. I'd been hit on the head a couple of times and it was really dark. 
And all of a sudden I saw the, the driver's side door open and this guy in gray sweats step out. And then I saw him reach into his pants. And then I just turned and I ran. And then I heard two shots. Now, whether they were in my direction or just up in the air, I'm not sure. But uh, that day changed my life, you know, and I, I was filled with so much anger, uh, so much shame. And I, I, I was just obsessed and but driven purely from this, this, this anger, this feeling of violation, this feeling like, oh, my God, I, I, I thought I was tough and I, I thought I could protect my friend and I couldn't. And man, you know, I, I couldn't see anything other than the anger. So I, so I committed to myself. I was like, man, that experience like this is never, ever, ever going to happen to me again. And, um, you know, I graduated and when I got my job, I got a very good job in Silicon Valley that paid a lot of money. And so I had freedom from that. So I could, it afforded me the ability to train with masters and teachers. And so I sought out, I went to di distinct paths. So the one thing I said was, all right, so who are, who are going to be the baddest instructors I could learn from? And, uh, I thought, man, the people training the military and the police, they've got to be, know something different than, you know, in, 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 in a dojo or whatever, because they're preparing people for life and death. At the same time, I've always had Bruce Lee's The Tao of Jeet Kune Do with me, and Bruce Lee had influenced me a lot. And then I started to read Bruce Lee's philosophies and started to really get into it. And, um, and, and that pointed the way. And then I, I found a Jeet Kune Do instructor uh, who had trained the Navy SEALs and stuff like that. And then I, became one of his, his disciples and eventually took over for him and started teaching. But I went down that hardcore street fighting path. Now at the same time, uh, I, I also, so this is going to be funny. Okay. And, uh, and listeners are going to laugh at this, but remember this is a 22 year old kid that was like driven with anger. I was like, man, I, I, mean, I need to learn the death touch. Like I need to learn the death touch. That's what I need to learn. I'm going to learn how to touch people and turn them off. So I was obsessed. Right. And uh, said, man, who's going to teach me the death touch? It's going to be really weird. Right. And uh, so I got all the books possible on it and everything pointed to like the Chinese meridians, the acupuncture points. And so then I was like, okay, I'm an engineer. I'm going to reverse engineer this. So you know what I'll do? I'll in enroll in a four year medical Qigong program. So I enrolled in a four year medical Qigong program, which is designed to help people learn how to heal. But I figured that if I went that route, I could learn the other thing too. And, and, um, and then I got into the Tai Chi and uh, the internal art, uh, the Qigong, the Neigong, and the Shengong. Although the most interesting thing happened, and in my book I talk about it, there's a chapter, it's called From the Death Touch to the Healing Hand. I was driven by all this anger. And then when I went through the process of self-discovery, and I went through the layers, and I started to do the meditations, and I, and I started to release the anger and the shame, all of a sudden I was able to like forgive my attackers, I was, let, I was able to let that go. And as I was able to let that go, all of a sudden that anger disappeared and it was replaced by love and this, this idea of healing. And, and I started to heal myself. And then I was like, wow, there's so much more. So I continued down that internal arts path with the Tai Chi and the Qigong and Neigong. And then on the other side, I was following the Bruce Lee philosophy. I was like, okay, so What's, what was Bruce Lee's mission? What was his path? What was his, his, his way of self-discovery? So I was, I was more obsessed with the path that he took than the end result that he got to. So we know that he started with Wing Chun Kung Fu. And so I said, okay, I want to immerse myself in the traditional way of learning that art. So I went through that and I was like, all right, so there's a boxing element to this. There's a kickboxing element to this. So then I started training with a professional boxer and then kickboxers. And then I went to learn the French art of savat uh, from Daniel Duby de Laverne in, in Reunion Island off the coast of Madagascar, because he was the guy that was one of the last people teaching the actual um, old school street fighting savat versus the, the box francais, which was more for the ring of how you really use the boot as a hammer and the way you kick and do all that. So I learned that from him. Um, I also got into wrestling and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and got coaches and teachers in that and started to study each of those arts. Um, and then I also got into Kali, Filipino Kali, uh, the, the knife and the stick and the, the swords. And then all started studying the various different systems of Kali and then really falling in love with uh, Sarada from Angel Kabbalist, this Angel's Disciples lineage. And, and then I started to, to really, I mean, I dedicated eight hours a day to this. And then after a while I left my job and, I just focused 100% of the time 
on on training and teaching and um lo and behold now i'm here and uh i i found and discovered through that one event who i truly was what my purpose was that it wasn't designed to be in in the silicon valley in a cube which i hated i just was doing that because uh, you know i was just like hey siliconvalley.com i'm going to become a millionaire i'm going to get a sports car i'm going to buy a house and have stock options i was driven totally superficially and then everything changed. And then I went on this journey of self-discovery. And, and then I realized my purpose was to spread courage, confidence, and clarity in using martial arts as a vehicle. And uh, that brings me to present day today. And, and I wouldn't change anything for a thing. Wow, that's, that's quite a story. And you talked about, you talked about a lot of different stuff in there. And, and we could probably go back and pick about 10 different sections that we could fill another hour with each. <laughs> but there's one that I want to talk about in particular. Sure. And there's some surface stuff to it that's pretty obvious, but I, I've got a feeling that there's a little bit more. You talked about, and, and by the way, the idea of, a, of a, being a young child growing up on a ship, that sounds really cool. The first image that comes to mind is something like from, from Waterworld. And I know that that's not what it is. <laughs> you think close to what it is, but that, that was, that was the, the image that came to my mind was you running around on, on a ship and, and no land in sight. And everything. Yeah. That, was, that was fun. So I'm just going to, I'm going to hold on to the, hold on to that, that image for a little while longer. But you said you took a break, you know, and that's one of the things that, that, you know, we talk about on the show from time to time. Martial arts is always there for you. And so during this gap, this incredibly intense situation arises. And just the way you're talking about it, it's clear that this struck you. You said this was in 2001. And, yeah. you know, that's a story that's 17 years old. If you graduated in 2001, even a, a little bit longer, right? Mm -hmm. 17 yeah. and a half years. Yeah. But the way you described it was as if it made such an impression, such a permanent mark on your mind that I'm sure you could recount a whole bunch of other details that you didn't share with us. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's as fresh in my mind as, yeah. as, as, as the day that it happened. You know? so. And when something happens that, that's, that is that powerful, when it leaves that lasting of an impression, it becomes pivotal. You know, it, it's, it's a milestone. It's a moment that we can look back. And obviously, your concern, your desire to not be in similar situations again or to feel at least a little more prepared in similar situations, should they arise, led you towards some of the training that you did. Yeah. But what I want to talk about is how you felt in the, in the, the few days immediately after. You had stopped training. Put it on pause, however you want to look at it. And I know how I would feel in that situation. I, I've got a, a guess as to how many people would feel in that situation when we combine such a significant occurrence with the fact that it happened during a time when you weren't training. Yeah. Yeah. Is there something there? Am I, am I, am I, am yeah, I? no, absolutely. The days after, you know, you're like, um, you're kind of like in a, a haze. Like when you have like, so when you, when you, when you say, like, when you meet the kiss of death comes that close to you and, you know, you, you just got out of that. If, if those two guys hadn't walked by, I don't know. I don't know how we would have survived because I remember when the ambulance left, they weren't moving. My roommate was beaten badly. You know, it took him, it took him some time to recover. I snapped my elbow. I'd been cracked on the head. And, you know, I was just running around, but I would have probably ran out of gas eventually or something who knows what could have happened so divine intervention saved us so from two perspectives you're sitting there like oh my god a i can't believe this happened to me then b you're like more i was thinking about i'd never experienced anything like that before you know i've never seen anything like that yeah and it, you know i've been in a lot of fights growing up and even while i was still in college even though i wasn't practicing i'd still had a few uh, uh fights here and there break out of parties and things like that. I mean, it's college, right? But still nothing like that, you know? And, and so the, the experience was so overwhelming that 
it shakes you, you know, and, and I think that the universe has a certain design. So whenever something happens to us, like it's a disastrous moment that we can, we have two ways of looking at it. We can look at it like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened to me. And then let our thoughts kind of feed that energy or the idea becomes, okay, why did this happen to me? And do we use this as a catalyst for growth? And that's kind of what I started to switch into right away because I was like, there's never been a time when I trained anything like this. I trained this kind of mindset that I had, I, or this feeling, right? So this feeling, I was like, you know, there's that thing, you, you fight the way you train and you train the way you fight. So there'd never been a time that I'd experienced the feeling, let alone not knowing the strategy, but the feeling, right? And so those two things were seriously missing. So I totally felt like, I, I didn't know what to do. And that's what scared me more than anything. I was like, I can't believe I had no idea. And I'd spent, you know, third, six to 19, 13 years training and teaching and competing and doing all that, a big part of my life. And I thought I knew or had a sound, you know, understanding of it. And, and I realized I really didn't have a clue. And so that, it was like a feeling of being so lost and frustrated and angry, man, I was angry. I remember the feeling was just anger. I felt violated. I think anybody that has gone through abuse or some kind of physical trauma like that, that somebody else imposes on them, they feel violated. And then there's an, a, an element of, and I'll be honest, of shame. I felt shame. I felt like less than a man. I was like, I can't believe this was done to me. And I didn't know what to do. And I didn't my ego was hurt. I was like, I couldn't save my roommate. I'm supposed to be this badass karateka. And I couldn't do it. And, and who I thought I was was just shattered in that moment, you know? And, um, but it was like one of the most freeing moments of my life because that led me into really well, driven by anger, obviously. But afterwards, what I discovered would never have been possible without it. But really, like to answer your question, was that this feeling was just anger and shame, not knowing, feeling lost and uncertain, and, and you didn't have an anchor, right? Because th I thought I always had an anchor that in this realm of martial arts and protecting myself and protecting my loved ones, I always thought I had an anchor. And that anchor now wasn't there. And it was a big part of who I thought I was, because even though I was in, in uh, I wasn't actively training, my mindset was still always that of martial artist. So when I approached my studies, things got tough. It was that idea of, ah, this isn't tough. I can get through this. Oh, this is a challenge. All right, let's head it on. Oh, things are getting too stressful. Let's do some breathing exercises. So that was always like my, my, the warrior. The warrior was still there. But then I felt that the warrior had been injured and uh, the spirit had been injured. And that, uh, that was the scary part. Mm. that anger you know make, makes complete sense and it's something that I'm, I'm sure i would experience in that situation but where was it directed were you angry at yourself or others uh i was angry a at myself but more at those guys like <laughs> I, would, I would sit there and think of things like oh man get so angry and sit there and be like you know these guys come at this beach like this I'm going to do some Rambo stuff and approach them by the boat, come from the ocean. And, you know, all the movies you watch as a child, like Commando and all this, and you start running these scenarios, these crazy whacked out scenarios in your mind that you're never going to do. But you're like, why am I even thinking it? Later on, I'm going to be like, why am I even thinking of this stuff? I get a machine gun, and I gun all these guys down. That's what I was thinking, because that's how violated I felt. And, and um, it was, you know, like, we have emotions and later I learned, obviously, our emotions are energy and energy has to be processed and transformed and, and let go. And one of the most important things for even the listeners out there that if you've had a traumatic experience, you have to get in touch with the emotion that's there. You have to feel it. You have to be able to talk about it. You know, it's not easy. It wasn't easy for me as a younger person to sit there and talk about my emotions because I stuffed them. And you didn't feel much like a man to go out and tell people you feel angry and shamed and shameful and using these words and hurt, this terminology, and then even a, a level of sadness that this thing happened to you. But once you understand the emotions, you get to feel them. You feel them. That helps to start to process them. And then eventually, you, you want to extract the wisdom 
from the experience. And once you can extract the wisdom from the experience and process the emotions and let it go and realize that this moment was a gift, and the moment was a gift, and your attackers were a gift because they came and nudged you into the direction of who you were supposed to become, not who you think you are. It's what I thought I was at that time. I was totally superficially driven. I only wanted to make money. I was doing a career I hated, but I did it. I said, I'm going to become an engineer just because I'm going to get in the Silicon Valley and make money. I didn't, there wasn't a single thing I enjoyed about it. Every single class, every single workday was torture for me. But uh, I, I was in this prison that I'd created myself and my attackers, God bless them, uh, freed me from. Absolutely powerful stuff. Now, when you look back on that moment and those feelings, how much of it have you let go of? All of it. 100%? 100%. Okay. Wow. All of it, you know, and uh, that's what allowed me then to, so what, uh, I, I used to, I used to, uh, I lost my hair to alopecia when I was 13 years old. And um, so I wore a wig from 13 to 28. This attack happened to me when I was about 23 years old. And so I was still wearing a wig and covering my head. But when I, this attack got me into this, this process of self-discovery, this way of self-healing that I didn't even know because I was <laughs> looking to learn the death touch. And in doing so, when I was able to let go of that anger first, then I was able to see, oh man, wow, this is who I actually am. A whole compartment of energy opened up. But there's another event that I've got to share with you in the story that's really important and, and it really ties in. That happened in the June of 2001. But in August of 2001, I suffered a horrible car accident also in San Francisco. A cab driver ran a red light at the intersection of Sansom and Sacramento. And it was like a one way. I didn't see it. He ran a red light and he T-boned me. He hit me on the passenger side. And luckily, obviously, I was on the driver's side. That passenger side door crumpled all the way into the center console, so much so that I couldn't take the faceplate off my stereo system. The car went 20 feet and hit a pole on the other side. I was able to walk away from that, but I injured my L4 and L5 vertebrae. I tore the muscles in my abdominal column. I injured my neck, and I was jacked up. So I couldn't, obviously, my senior year of tennis was gone coming up for the next year. However, again, that was a huge blessing for me because I was interning at Franklin Templeton's Investments that summer, and there was a business trip, which was kind of like a reward. You're a college kid going to Franklin Templeton, and you know, you're, you're working, and it, it, when they tell you, oh, yeah, you do a good job, you can get to go on this business trip to Manhattan and, and stay there for a week. That's a huge reward. So all summer, I was looking forward to that. This car accident happened. I missed two and a half weeks of work, so I was behind on my project, so I couldn't attend that business trip. But I was scheduled to be in uh, World Trade Center Tower Number 2 on the 92nd floor at 8 a.m. on 9-11. So now that happened. So now that event happened. And then the other, so that event happened. The car accident happened. The attack happened. All in a span of like three months. And that, those just shook my world completely. So I started to ask the question. With my car accident, I had to figure out ways to rehab my back with the, with the, um, with the uh, missing the World Trade Center horrific terrorist act uh, that, that I still feel so sad about so many people we lost. Um, that, that rattled my spirit. Like, man, there's got to be more to life. So you start asking this question. So you start asking this question, there's got to be more to life. Then I'm asking the question, how do I fix myself physically? And then I'm asking the question, how do I... <laughs> <laughs> learn, to, learn ways to, to finish my opponents as fast as possible and what's the martial way. So these three things were catalysts that really kind of pushed my development. And now when I think back and I look at it, that summer of 2001 was, was pivotal because it changed every part of me. Um, not only did I recover from my back injury, it took me five years to figure out ways to do it. Doctors told me to have surgery and they said I'd never really move the way I could again and all this kind of stuff. And I didn't listen to any of that stuff. I went back in and once again, what led me into the Tai Chi was getting attacked. And when I got into that, I learned the, the, the Qigong and the, 
the nagong and the breathing and the energy work um it also led me into like looking into systems of physical fitness that didn't involve lifting weights and stuff like that so i started to do body weight exercises i got into kettlebells and then i was able to not only recover from the injury but turn myself into an athlete like never before where i continued that process where today i'm 41 years old and I can confidently tell you that the 21, 22-year-old version of me that was an NCAA athlete couldn't hold a candle to me 20 years later on any physical fitness assessment test. From running a 40-yard dash to lifting weight to focus to speed to coordination wouldn't even be com comparable. And uh, it just it's so interesting how all these things kind of happen. And... Um, uh, it's, it's blessed. So, you know, I turned disaster into your master and what can you learn from it? And now looking back, and that's one of the biggest things that I teach my students. And you realize that, hey, you have a specific path, especially as a teacher and all the teachers listening out there that are martial artists that teach because there's something greater that they're giving. You know, we teach punching and kicking, but it's so much more than that. We're teaching a way of life. We're teaching people how to deal with struggle. We're teaching people how to find who they truly are. Uh, that this is a process of self-discovery and that's a priceless gift that we give people we're teaching them the warriors way which is which is what got us all in it forget about styles and systems there's always arguments on the internet about this style and that style and my master is better than your master and it's just a big waste of time we're all so much more alike than we are apart we do it for the same reasons. We do it to discover who we are. We do it for the way uh, of the warrior. We do it for the community that we build. We do it for courage, confidence, and clarity. And we do it because it's a lot of fun. So we're sitting out there pushing ourselves to find who, what's the next level that we can get. What's the ultimate version of ourselves we could be instead of sitting on, t sitting on, the, on the couch, watching other people trying to achieve their dreams and eating potato chips. Mm. Are you familiar with the book or the movie Way of the Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman? Yes, I am. Wonderful, wonderful. Your, your story reminds me a lot of that. Yeah, maybe. There's some, there's some similarities in there. And, and um, listeners, if, if you've never read that book or seen that movie, the, the movie does a good job, but the, the book is incredibly powerful. It's the wonderful. book is incredible. I've, I've read the book. It's incredible. Yeah, it's, Actually, yeah. I read the book <laughs> in the process, you know, because when I was, I just started, wanted to seek knowledge. Yeah. So as I wanted to seek knowledge, I was looking everywhere for knowledge. That's, that was everywhere. I was, in, I was gorging books, philosophy yeah. books. And, um, you know, I could sit here, we could make it all about the books I read, but <laughs> I read hundreds upon hundreds of books. And I think books are some of the most amazing things in the world because the stories allow you to connect to other people's experiences. Mm. And then they, they plant ideas in your head that cause you to ask more questions. Absolutely. But asking the question is, is the whole thing, right? The quest is based on the question. Yeah. Yeah. There's something pretty powerful about the written word. You know, when, when people look at, cell phones, smartphones, and say, you know, we've got all these ways of communicating. And the one that's still so many people default to is texting. To me, that makes complete sense. There's something, <laughs> yeah. there's something inherent in yeah. simple writing and communicating in that way that just, it just works. And it's worked for a very long time. I think you're you know, absolutely yeah. right. I think you're absolutely right. If I asked you to recommend a book from the multitude that you read, Mm -hmm. one especially the one that maybe listeners haven't read what would you recommend the monk who sold his ferrari oh uh, the title already has me <laughs> yeah. why that one it was about it was, it was about this journey right so you when you when you're seeking like, why do most people i think people read books for two reasons number one people read like uh, fictional books to be entertained, be taken on a journey. And, uh, you know, so there's one way. And then there's other books that are non-fictional where people are seeking some kind of answer. And so they're reading for information. But The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari is one that's giving you the information, but also telling you a, a fable, a wonderful story. And so it, it takes you on this journey of, of self-discovery. And for somebody who's asking the questions, here was a book that 
talk about a guy that went through it about this you know it's a little i don't want to give it all away but it's about a lawyer who like you know is super successful and then he gets divorced and all this kind of stuff and he's living like this horrible lifestyle and he becomes an alcoholic and then he goes on this this um this quest for knowledge and he meets these monks in india and um he starts this process of self-discovery and and what are what what is that process and it kind of catalogs that and then he comes back into society and um and and shows like how now as a transformed person he realizes that service really is the is the highest power the ultimate goal and we have to first you know discover who we are so you've got to do the work first on yourself so like i say you got to put the oxygen mask on yourself to get who you truly are and really to the root of who you are i think that's all the best books that i've ever read are about answering the question who are you like who are you truly i mean even general sun tzu know yourself and know your enemy and you're sure to succeed but knowing yourself is, 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 is a lifelong process and yourself, who you are continuously changes. So it's not one set self. You're always changing. So it's a continual process of knowing who you are and, and from there and discovering it. And then, Oh, what's the next layer? You keep peeling back the layers of the onion, layers of the onion, layers of the onion. And, and, and you get deeper and deeper and deeper. And I think the books that really strike us, that really strike a chord always have some element of that self-discovery aspect and when you can feel somebody else's pain um, that and pain that you've experienced yourself and they can describe it in a way that it's even better than you can describe it it it, it catches you emotionally and you know like i always say and it's a known fact that you're only willing people most people will only change when the pain of the experience they're going through is greater than the pain of change. So, you know, and, and that's like a commonality throughout all great books, you know? So, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just quietly agreeing with you. Yeah. So the monk who sold his Ferrari is a great one. The alchemist is another great one. Um, you know, obviously, most of the readers here probably, I mean, I have my Bibles. They're sitting right next to me is um, uh, 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 Sun Tzu's The Art of War, Miyamoto mm -hmm. uh, Musashi, Goren no Sho. But here's another great book that you, people could really enjoy. It's, it's one of my, te my teachers wrote it. It's called A Master's Journey, Secret Memoirs of a Warrior, Healer, and Mystic. It's a really cool book. Um, about self-discovery and the process and, it, and it's a true stories that he went through and the teachings and it really gives a oh, great idea of what the idea of Kung Fu really is about you know most people stop at the level of punching and kicking um, and, and keep trying to take that into the highest level possible but that's it's, it's really much lower level if you think about it because the highest level of martial arts regardless whether it's Kung Fu or Karate or Jutsu or whatever your art may be that you're practicing, it's, it's about perception. It's, and, and perception comes down to energy. And energy comes down to how much available energy do you have for the present moment. So how much of your energy is available? And oftentimes, a lot of your energy is used to hold on to previous stories, past ideas, previous traumas. All those things, when they're in your body, they're, still, they're taking energy. So we, we, don't, we lose track of that. We lose the awareness around that because it gets buried in our subconscious. And the process of opening up our subconscious to let go of those energy draining um, stories and ideas that are stored in your cells and DNA that you've held on to since you were a child. And the moment you start to let go of that, your perceptions start to increase. It's almost like, um, you know, when you, when you get your first boxing lesson, if you've got a good teacher, they're not going to teach you how to throw until you get over the fear of being hit. So, if, so my first four months boxing, I had one hand behind my back, the other hand up on my chin, and I was just taking punches and getting over the fact of being hit. And then after a while, you just say, okay, I'm not afraid of being hit anymore. And the moment you're not afraid of being hit anymore, any punch that comes, it comes like it's in slow motion. So your perception changes because the fear of being hit 
takes your energy away. And then you're feeding that fear. And then you feed that fear, it gets you out of the moment. And so you only have a little bit of energy left to the actual act of defending the punch. But the moment you can let go of the fear or whatever, and this fear of being punched, fear of failure, fear of what other people think, a fear of not being good enough, whatever the fears that are out there in your life, when you can let go of them, you have more energy for the experience. Then you can open up to the experience instead of trying to defend or protect or worry or, or, or guard. And when you can let go of that, man, it's the coolest feeling in the world. It's freedom, you know? And so you can either be in fear or you can be in freedom. Martial arts give you the, gives you a direct way to it because somebody's throwing a punch at you. So the moment you're not afraid to be hit anymore, like, oh my God, I'm, I'm not afraid. And, and, and now you go into regular life and fears hit you. You're like, that's just a derivative. I've already, I'm not afraid of somebody actually hitting me. So why should I be afraid of a projected fear like what somebody else thinks or a fear of failure that hasn't even happened yet because it's in the future or, or, or the fear of, of, of not being good enough. Who cares? Then you're free, man. Right on. Now, you, you've spoken about the multitude. I mean, just the sheer, I, I think I counted six or seven martial arts that you said you've trained. Yeah, at least, yeah. yeah. <laughs> which it's, it's a lot and it, it's awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that in any kind of negative way. I've done the same thing and I, I think it's great. I, I love cross training. I love connecting dots between different arts. So when you look at those folks that you've trained with, whether it's the boxing instructor, you know, for four months, you're only taking shots, not giving them or, you know, the jujitsu instructor or someone else. Who, when you look at who you are as a martial artist today, mm-hmm. which of those instructors had the greatest influence? I would have to say my, my Tai Chi masters, you know, uh, Sifu Arnold Tayem and Sifu Jerry Allen Johnson, you know, they, and Sifu Bender, uh, because they came at me more from a self-discovery standpoint than from a pure fighting standpoint and uh, discuss the energetic psychology with me. And that energetic psychology of who you are and helping answer that question um, transcends like physical limitations. And, you know, all my instructors, I love them to death. You know, I wouldn't be who I am without them. But they gave me a foundation or the roots of, of coming from an internal perspective uh, than just an external physical perspective. And that really helped shape everything that I do because I come from my core being of who I am and look for the moment and look to master the moment. And through mastering the moment, whether I'm boxing or doing jujitsu or chikundo do or whatever it is that I'm doing, I'm able to access a higher version of myself, uh, a higher version of attention and awareness into the moment and express myself honestly. And to be, to be honest, like, you know, Bruce Lee, even though he wasn't my teacher, I still think is the greatest influence in my life because it was his teachings that I was after, his philosophy that I was after. And I realized that the philosophy, what everything he wrote in the books that he talked about, I was learning, getting a chance to learn it through the, the Tai Chi training progressions and process. And the interesting thing is if you look at the core symbol of Jeet Kune Do, it's not a Jeet Kune Do logo. It's a Tai Chi logo. It's pointing the way to the internal philosophies of Tai Chi and of the Tao, of, of the way the rules of nature, of that process of self-discovery. And, you know, he picked that symbol to represent um, this overlying uh, philosophy because Jeet Kune Do is philosophy in motion. So the Jeet Kune Do led me to all the other arts. But Jeet Kune Do is the way of the intercepting fist. And you can only be intercepting someone if you can perceive what they're going to do. Oftentimes people think interception is just about speed. That's not true. Okay, to a certain degree, of course. If we fight only on the physical realm, of course. But the idea is that beyond that, how do we access other levels of perception and awareness? What's the difference between Michael Jordan and everybody else? Okay, you... When you look at NBA athletes at that level, they're all amazing athletes. They can all put up the same physical numbers. They can all dunk. They can all shoot. They can all do that. But Michael Jordan was able to slow down time 
when it counted the most and do it more often than anybody else. He wanted the ball when the ball, when the game was on the line. He wasn't afraid to shoot. He was in the moment and he mastered the moment. That's the difference between Michael Jordan and everybody else. But it's the same thing in martial arts. And, and more so, you have to master the moment. What did Miyamoto Musashi said? You have to go into the void. Here's a guy that's a masterless samurai, wasn't trained by anybody, but was able to use his mind and access greater levels within himself because he had already dealt with fear and anger and, and, and the, the, the fear of failure in the future or not being stuck and limited to his experiences in the past. Because oftentimes we look to our experiences in the past, bring them into the present moment, and try to solve the, solu- the problem based on what we've experienced. That only works so far as to a situation that you've already been uh, in before. But if you're in a situation you've never been in before, you can't really go on to past experiences to help solve you in that situation. You have to be open to the experience and, and, and accept and let yourself figure it out in, on the fly. But the only way that can ever happen is if you have 100% of your energy available to the moment and to the experience and to connecting to your opponent, adapting to them and creating the solution versus being up in your head trying to think of a solution. The moment you go in your head and you start to think, you go into the past. And, and that's going to instantly make you slower. So these concepts and principles that Bruce Lee talked about, I was actually able to learn them in, uh, in the Taiji training of the, of the Qigong and the Neigong and, and that process, I was able to then bring back over into anything I did. And um, so I think the underlying factor, long roundabout way, is, is, is from that internal training that, and I still continue to this day. There's no, the beautiful thing, there's no mastery to the, the self, the internal version of yourself. So there's no limit to that. And uh, the more, the deeper you go, the better you feel. And the better you feel, the more relaxed you get. But you just keep peeling away layer after layer. And it's very uncomfortable. I mean, that's where you really need a warrior spirit. I don't care about people beating up on me or taking punches, being choked out. That's nowhere near as difficult as taking a look at yourself honestly in the mirror, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and being able to accept and love it. Cool stuff. Now let's flip that question on its head. If you could train with someone you haven't, who would that be? I have to be. We have to be Bruce Lee, man. Uh, you know, the most Bruce, common answer to that question, without a doubt, it would have to be Bruce Lee. You know, um, I, I think that I would. I would just love to uh, to experience it, to experience uh, the mastery that he had over the moment, uh, over his body, over his mind, over the philosophy, and be around that energy. And um, and and if you think about it, his energy, was so amazing. That to this day, that's why it's the most popular answer because his energy burst out through the screen. Yeah. Right? It just burst out through the screen. It just because he was honest, even though he was playing a character, the energy from within him would come out, right? And so that, and everybody connected to that and, and wanted to feel that within themselves. And, and I think he was the perfect balance between killer instinct and higher consciousness. And together, the two parts of who we are as beings, who's expressing it honestly. And, and that's something so difficult to do, but doing it and doing it in the time when there was a, you know, much more racism, being the first uh, non-Caucasian person to star in a role, um, you know, in like Warner Brothers and, and, and breaking barriers. I mean, when him and Linda got married, it was illegal for interracial marriage. Uh, he was the first person teaching but the, these martial arts principles outside of the Chinese circles. At that time, it was all secret. Of course, if you weren't Chinese, you're not going to get it. And so he broke down so many barriers, you know, and so many different levels that, uh, yeah, it would, it would just be amazing to, to be around his energy for, for real for a while. Mm, yeah, no, no doubt whatsoever on my mind. Now, you mentioned some things about competition, I think, more early on in your martial arts career. Competition, of course, is a, it can be a polarizing subject in the martial arts. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, tell us a bit about your experience with it and your thoughts on it today. Uh, so I competed in, uh, since I was six years old, up until 18, I competed in uh, a kata and I competed in point sparring. And, um, you know, the funny thing is, 
up until I was 13 years old, I lost. I lost all the time. And I lost the six years, I lost. I lost at everything I did. I never won a match. And all of a sudden, when I was 13 years old, the, the head sensei was replaced. We had a new head sensei who came in and he had a different approach slightly. And uh, I jived with him a lot. And all of a sudden, I went from never winning. You know, we had an annual tournament every year with over 40 schools that would come and take part. And uh, I, I started to win. And, uh, and I won four years in a row and I was undefeated in, in point sparring. I think that, um, and now I don't compete, but I spar a lot. Um, I, I roll a lot, so I do spar a lot, but I don't necessarily enter competition. Um, but what I think that's really cool about sparring or being in a competition is not about the winning, it's about learning to lose. It's about accepting failure and invest. There's a Taiji saying, we say invest in loss. You have to invest in loss because after you lose and lose and lose and lose, each time you should get better because you extract the wisdom from the experience. And as you do that, you'll get better. Because when you win, when you win, you win. And when you lose, you get better. So there's really no difference between victory and defeat. So competition gives you an opportunity for that. Another thing competition gives you an opportunity for, it gives you an opportunity to deal with stress and pressure um, and things of that nature. So it gives you, it's not, it's still not a, a, a full on street fight per se or it's life and death yet, but it, it gives you a, a progression to, to see what you can and you can't do. So then you, once you, you, you can do point sparring, then you can get into boxing, and you can get into wrestling, jiu-jitsu, and MMA. And we do a lot of that in our training. I spar as many people as possible. So all my coaches and stuff, I spar them. And um, so it's not necessarily a competition per se, but it's an for me, when I train with them, because I train up, I train with people much better than me in those disciplines, it gives me an opportunity to make myself comfortable in an uncomfortable situation. So that's what I'm always looking for out of these kinds of things. To me, it's not about winning and losing. It's about, can I make myself comfortable in an uncomfortable situation? My jujitsu teacher, Professor Marcel Lozado, smashes me for two hours, and you're just trying to breathe and make it through. You're tapping all over the place, but you're like, man, I'm not going to get tired. I'm not going to give up because I psyched myself out mentally. I'm not going to give up because the, 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 uh, the situation is so uncomfortable. And then when you make yourself comfortable in that uncomfortable situation and you enjoy the smashing, it, it changes your mindset. You get into when a box with my uh, boxing coach, Derek Sierra, a former pro boxer, big dude, moves so smooth. And, 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 and he, every time he hits you, it's like, freaking cannonball going off and you accept that every time you go in it's again a victory over yourself it's not about you beating the other person it's an opportunity to gain victory over yourself by making yourself comfortable in that situation so i, I like i said i spar with people better than me in the individual disciplines that i learn and that makes me better and then that makes me better at the experience and um, putting myself in the zone so that i can create connect and adapt and, and, and it's fun because it's an op that once you get past fear, once you get past the discomfort, you have the ultimate ability to achieve stillness. So there's three levels of stillness. There's stillness and stillness, which is, okay, standing or seated meditation. Then there's stillness and movement. All right, now you're finding stillness in a form or in a kata or in shadow boxing. But then it, the, the, those are all progressions to get you to find stillness and movement under chaos. And now you can you find the stillness when you're moving and adapting while somebody's actively trying to stop you. And then if you can achieve the stillness in that moment, that to me is uh, what it's about. Hmm. What do your parents think of all this? They love it, you know, yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> they love it now, but just like any parents that love their, their, their children, you know, they're like, oh man, you're an engineer. You're going to be set for life. Uh, you know, I was getting to the business side of engineering and strategic marketing and intelligence towards the later part of my career there. And they just want you to be successful. So they don't, if they don't know something about, you know, um, a field of, or a profession that they don't know about, you know, it's natural for them to feel a little um, apprehensive. 
but they were always supportive. They were always supportive, and they're like, okay, we trust you, and go for it. Nobody ever said no to me, but uh, I, I do know that they definitely felt like, okay, uh, you know, be, be careful and take care of yourself and all that. And, and uh, I've never looked back, and neither have they, and they're super proud of me now, you know, and they're super proud of what I'm doing and having an opportunity because a big part of what I do is I, I love the martial arts. I love teaching. I love training. I love that. But a big part of my business and my mission is to spread these teachings and philosophies outside of the martial art world. So I, I'm a, um, a speaker and a uh, high performance coach. So I work with a lot of executives and I work with uh, entrepreneurs and I give talks all around the world. So, you know, I speak on the same stages as I've had the honor of speaking on the same stages like Sir Richard Branson and uh, Jack Canfield from Chicken Soup for the Soul and uh, worked, uh, you know, given talks at companies like Apple and um, Morgan Stanley Investments and ASICs and Hilton and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm giving about two to three talks a month where I go in as a professional speaker and I, I talk about various topics of self-mastery. And it's all stuff that I've learned through the martial arts. And it's all about teaching them how can they achieve the highest version of themselves. And I don't teach them any martial arts. Just teach them the philosophies behind it. And it's really energetic psychology, self-discovery. How do you deal with stress? How do you prepare yourself for the day? When you're in a situation, how do you deal with people? What are the different personality types? Um, how do you uh, plan? And how do you, and because most of it's about the person. Because there's four things we can train. We can train our craft, whatever it is that we're doing. So if you're in sales, you're in marketing, or martial arts, that's your craft. Or you're a painter or you're a musician, whatever, that's your craft. And then there's, there's the mind, the body. There's the mind, the energy, and the spirit. So, you know, people talk about the mind, obviously. People talk about the body. But oftentimes the mind, the body, uh, mind, the energy, and the spirit, though, that's about the individual taking part in the action. So the man, the living being, the creating individual is much more important than any style or system. So the person in the event is more important than the event themselves. So everybody always focuses on the tactic strategies of their craft, how do they get better at that? But there, the focus is never put as much on the individual taking part in it. And that's where I come in and help them with that. And I help them with leadership and help them to connect into the moment. I, and the biggest thing I say is, you know, I teach them how to become comfortable in uncomfortable situations. Because that is the true master key to success. When you're at the highest level of business or entrepreneurship or athletics or entertainment, or martial arts, combat, that is the skill that's going to actually determine victory or defeat because when everything goes crazy around you and you start to panic and your heart starts to pound and you start to get that armpit sweat and your mind starts to race, your ability to identify that and get yourself back into the moment is what's going to determine a victory or defeat. If you're going to lose and the person's better than you, so be it. But if you're going to lose because you can get a hold of yourself and make yourself relax on demand, which is a skill that has to be trained, then you're the enemy, the first enemy that you have to defeat is the enemy within. Right on. Now, what's going on in the future? What, what are your goals? What are your plans? You know, what, what big things in and outside of the martial arts are keeping you motivated? So in the martial arts, um, I have, uh, I'm about to launch a program, a joint program with Century Martial Arts, and uh, it's called Jeet Kune Do for Black Belt. Um, it's, it's, it's a master's program. So it's a place for martial artists that have, um, kind of, uh, learned their art and gotten to the highest levels of their art. So it's just for people who are already black belts that have dedicated a lifetime in it. And how do we, what's the next level? What's like the master's degree, like kind of not sense of like master as in I'm your master, but master's degree kind of like as in school, your master's and PhD degree of the self-discovery. And so first and foremost, you know, if you're like, make sure, you know, maybe you're a, a punching and a kicking art or striking art, then, you know, you got to balance out by learning uh, aspects of grappling and trapping and weapons. Maybe you're a, a grappling art, then you need to learn some strike. So basically balancing out first the five ranges. So there's five ranges of empty hand combat. There's the kicking, the punching, the trapping, the clinching um, or stand up wrestling. And, and, and on the ground. So you have to have the ability to flow through that. Today in the year 2019, 2018, you have to be able to be like water and transform through there. You also have to be able to use weapons. 
uh, like edge weapons and blunt weapons and be able to defend yourself over there. You have to be able to defend yourself in mass attack situations. You have to be able to defend yourself against people that are larger than you. And you also have to have theories and formulas and strategies on how to fight other martial artists that may challenge you from various different styles and systems. So tactics and strategies. So this kind of broken up into three areas. Well, number one is the development and cultivation of stillness in your perception. Number two is strategy. Okay, so strategy leads the way. So it's strategy and then the execution of the tools. And then the next part is the training methods that are there and the teaching methods so that we can become better teachers and, and become better trainers. And then there's a big aspect of self-discovery, kind of going through the same processes that I've gone through of discovering who we truly are, what are our natural gifts, bringing those things out. And, and so we've developed a program joint with Century. So we're going to launch that in 2019. Um, and, you know, like as most schools have a black belt program, so they're a black belt club. You could think about this as where you would go after that uh, into the master's program. And this is kind of a big thing that I'm very excited about, very honored to be working with Century with um, that's out there. I have another project that's already out there, which I did with the Budo Brothers, which is called Martial Arts for Everyone, which is more of an introductory program that kind of introduces people to all the various you know, aspects of martial arts and how to learn them in a very simple manner. Um, and I've done projects with Masters Magazine. I have Combat Chess coming out, which is all about tactics and strategy of how the combat is actually a chess match. So in the martial art world, I'm very excited with everything that's coming out uh, and have an ability to um, teach and ability to spread. And, and if, if people find it uh, beneficial to them, I'm more than happy to help them. And I'm really excited about that. I also have a book coming out. <clears throat> it's called Mind Boxing, How to Win the War Within. Uh, it should be coming out in summer of 2019. And this is a book that's targeted to people outside of the martial arts world. And it's more about the philosophical and the internal methods and teaching that allow people to dive inside and, you know, first and foremost, deal with stress and deal with the obsessive thinking of the mind to help turn it off. Because like you said, we live in a world today that is, you know, this digital world where we're always on and always connected, but, but we're very disconnected from who we truly are and disconnected in our relationships. And when we talk about performance, it has to first come with connection and balance to who you are yourself, you know, and your energy, and then connection to other people. So it's, it's a book about self-mastery. It's about the book about discovering the cause of your own ignorance and, and laid out in a manner that takes you in a progression to, to self-discovery. And, um, and speaking and, and talking all over the world at various different companies and conferences and things of that nature and helping to influence as many people as possible. Um, I've been blessed with my experiences and then the teachers and um, I love what I do. To, I've been blessed with being able to find what I love to do. So uh, now it's just about, okay, how many people can I help uh, on this path of courage, confidence, and clarity? And what else can I continue to learn? You know, because it's a constant path of growth and learning. So I'm more than anything excited about the future growth and the learning curves that of the things that I don't know yet. Because for sure, the thing that I do know more than anything, the ultimate truth is. The more I train, the more I learn, the more I realize that I don't know. And, and that's an awesome feeling because that means I can keep growing uh, till the day I take my last breath. Mm. So well said. If people want to find out more about the things that you talked about or follow you on social media or any of that, where would they go? Uh, my, my Twitter and Instagram is at Sifu Singh, S-I-F-U-S-I-N-G-H. Um, and my, uh, Facebook is my name, Harinder Singh Subarwal. So you can reach me on Facebook there. And my website is, uh, sifusing.com, um, jkdathletics.com. That's my organization. We have about 50 schools across the world, uh, with instructors. So if you're looking for Jeet training, you can check that website out. And then mindboxing.com, uh, which is, uh, with, with regards to my book and my corporate speaking, and uh, high-end coaching for executives and entrepreneurs. And I have another project that's launching this year. It's been ongoing kind of, uh, I've been doing it for two years, but really taking it full-fledged out there. It's actually called The Masterful Man. 
and it's a training training program that teaches the warrior's way for men uh, that are out there that are successful businessmen, um, that are people who are family men, and that are people that are you want want to maximize their health, maximize their success in business, and maximize their relationships at home, and really get the best out of life by discovering the warrior's way. So it, it's kind of think of like Fight Club meets the Jedi. Uh, put it a little bit together and that's kind of the experience we're crafting for them nice nice sounds great and of course folks we're going to link all that stuff over on the show notes whistlekick martial arts com, so you can check that out and one more thing as we wind down here what parting words would you give the audience i believe that there's no such word as master uh, there's only such thing as acting master and so that means that just act masterfully every single day, be impeccable in your thoughts, actions, and words, and be impeccable in conserving and building your own energy. Don't let yourself get to a point where you're completely depleted and then you have to bring yourself back. Do things that feed your energy, do things that build you up, and be cognizant of this and then protect that. Because when you're in that state of high, heightened energy, more energy, you have more energy not only for yourself, you have more energy for your martial arts, you have more energy for your relationships, your business. And you can only be in a state of having more energy when you can honestly express who you truly are and continue to ask that question, who are you? And continue to peel away the layers and uh, step by step, you'll enjoy the steps of the journey and it'll take you to freedom. I think we'd all agree that we are who we are because of where we've been, what we've done, what we've seen, how we've done it, who we've been around. But it's not too often that we can look at specific examples, a handful of occurrences that statistically shouldn't have happened, but they did. And they catapult us into a different direction on a different path. They allow us to become completely different people. But Sifu Singh is one of those people. He can look back and say, this allowed me to become who I am. And I appreciate him speaking so honestly, so openly about not only th those events, but everything that came after it and how it affected him. Thank you, sir, for your time today. We talked about a lot of stuff on today's show. You can find the links. You can find all kinds of great stuff in the show notes for this episode 358 over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you want to find us on social media, we are at Whistlekick. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. You can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Don't forget, save 15% with the code podcast15 at whistlekick.com. We're also on Amazon. I thank you for your time today. I appreciate you and you lending me your ears. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 